Okay, we're good to go. Welcome everyone to the Graphic Novels and Comics Roundtable and Intellectual Freedom Roundtable's presentation of Banned Books Week's webinars. This is the final. We've had five wonderful or four previous wonderful uh, webinars, and we hope that you find this also one of those informative and enlightening experiences to celebrate Banned Books Week. Our topic today is access issues, privatization, and gatekeeping. So we'll focus primarily on how uh, people who are in prison face unusual uh, access issues in uh, finding information and, and, e and reading material. Uh, David F. Walker is the primary speaker. He's author with Bitterroot, as you can see, and there's his contact information. Uh, I am uh, Eldon Ray James. I'm the moderator. Um, in addition to all of those things that you see there and my contact information, uh, I want to make it known that before I became a librarian, before I went to, uh, to the University of Texas High School to become a librarian, I was an inmate in a federal prison. So I spent five years in prison, so I have some idea about this particular topic. In addition to that, uh, the history of Banned Books Week is something that you can read here. Um, we, we celebrate, which is an unusual word for banned books, but we celebrate this because there are so many banned books and more and more being banned all the time that we need to have a special recognition for, for these books. And there are a number of sponsors and co-sponsors and millions and billions of people who um, participate in some sort of banned books week activities. Um, we have a keep the light on campaign, which you can see in our little logo, citizenship leaves us in the dark. We do send letters to banned books week. Uh, we send to banned authors, we send uh, uh, letters to them. We have these webinars, uh, promotional materials, and um, there are a number of uh, uh, libraries who have special programs, which are, are funded in part through a Freedom to Read Foundation grants uh, through the Judith Krug Awards. These are other resources that you can find about uh, research. Uh, Banned Books Week and Reporting Censorship. Uh, the Intellectual Freedom Roundtable also has a Facebook page called Intellectual Freedom Fighters, which you can uh, join and, uh, and, and read. And in addition to that, I would like to do a shout out to the, the, uh, the Marshall Report, which is, a, uh, which is an independent organization that does uh, excellent work uh, around uh, prison and prison resources and censorship. Uh, the graphic books, uh, graphic novels roundtable is one of our newest, and they are really uh, active in in supporting uh, library staff uh, with graphic novels and comics, as well as other aspects of collection development program and advocacy. And I'd en encourage you to join them if you. Uh, if you are interested at all in graphic novels. The Intellectual Freedom Roundtable is uh, the active arm of the intellectual freedom movement within the American Library Association. We have programs and activities, and we also act uh, in behalf of uh, ALA and Intellectual Freedom Matters, and we promote a, a greater involvement by the members of ALA as well as librarians in the pursuit of intellectual freedom. And you have our contact information on there. Image Comics is also a supporter. Uh, it's a comic book and graphic novel publisher founded in 92. And they uh, are extremely helpful in promoting uh, graphic novel and the image of graphic novels and comics in, uh, in the modern world. 
Today, we'll be discussing the role privatization plays in preventing information access, particularly in prison libraries, how biases impact access to information, and how gatekeeping, particularly by librarians, can be invisible but harmful. And now, David, yes. why don't we get this started? I'm ready when you are. Okay. Uh, I wanted to share with you something uh, from 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 my experience, uh, and and that was that people did not people who ran prison did not want us to have access to information. And I say this because I had a conversation with a correctional officer one time, and he says, well, "Why should I promote education and reading?" when if you don't come back to prison, I will be out of a job. Well, if that's the attitude of most people in prison, what happens? What happens to inmates who don't uh, work hard to get their own information? Well, I mean, that's, <laughs> I guess I, if we try to put a positive spin on it, at least he was honest, right? <laughs> At least he came out and said what he, <laughs> exactly. was, what he was thinking. But but therein lies the, um, I think the biggest problem of, of sort of, we'll call it the prison industrial complex is that um, it's built on, it's not built on rehabilitation, it's built on recidivism. It wants, it wants to keep itself open because there's money in it. And, and there's no money in, um, in, in prisons, if you rehabilitate the prisoners, if you give them access to, to information and, and provide them with the resources that, um, that they can improve their lives, come out and become active, um, I guess, for lack of a better term, positive members of society. I mean, that's, that's a whole other conversation as to what a positive member of society, of society is. Um, but it's, but hearing that is, is so disheartening what, what, this CO says to you because it um, because I know that that's sort of a pervasive mentality and there's this this notion that um, that the people's ability to change is so limited that once you're in prison that this is where you belong whatever you did you deserved to, you deserve to be there um, without really taking into consideration all the things that may have led to that um, to that incarceration and and I think that part of the, the um, you know, if, if we're talking about prisoners, prisoners trying to improve themselves, trying to improve their lives, we also have to look at, um, you know, the, the, the staff at prisons and, and what they see as their role. Is it, is it merely to warehouse or is it to be an active participant in that rehabilitation? But then again, that's putting their job in jeopardy, I guess. I, I mean, it's difficult because we're talking about humans and human lives, and yet we're, we're also talking about it in terms of, of big business. I mean, private prisons and, and prisons in general are just, they're huge business in this country. Uh, speaking of private prisons, do you think that they provide uh, sufficient resources to their prisoners, or are they, are, are they actually... Uh, limiting the, the resources to increase their profits? Well, you know, um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I'm going to guess that, yeah, they're probably limiting more than they're, they're helping. I mean, we have um, more people in prison now than we did 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Um, and again, it's become an industry. And, and um, I've known a lot of people who've done time. I know people who are doing time right now. I don't necessarily see the system in place to, again, to rehabilitate. And, and I think that by limiting the access to information, limiting the access to, uh, I can put it in, into context like this. I am not a prisoner. I, I, I don't have a, a felony record. I'm a professional writer. I write graphic novels, I write novels, I write comics. And I know that I have trouble accessing information and I am on the outside, you know. Um, 
I, I discovered um, in, in the process of doing research sometimes how difficult it can be just to get some really basic information. You, you look at the internet and it's cluttered with a lot of stuff um, that, that isn't necessarily relevant to whatever you're researching. It's, it's whatever uh, search engine and algorithms you know, put it out there. Um, I spend a lot of time at the public library and, and I, I live in Portland, Oregon, where we have a, you know, a great county library system. Uh, and even then I find myself at times limited by either what's on the shelves, um, limited by what the, um, the librarians who are helping me, what they know. And, and then, um, limited by, I mean, it, it sounds silly, but if you don't know the right words to type into a search engine you might never find what you're looking for right now all of these things can add up to a very difficult time for for me a person who is not incarcerated who lives in a county that has a really great library system um and, and in a very liberal city right now what happens if you are incarcerated in say a more conservative uh, county somewhere in the U.S., uh, around people who feel that certain thoughts and ideas shouldn't be readily available to whether it's certain types of people, and when I say certain types of people, we're talking about those that are incarcerated or just people in general. Um, the moment you have people making decisions about everyone's lives based on what they think is right or wrong, what they think is good information versus bad information, what they think is productive versus what is uh, counterproductive, we're running into some very serious problems. And, and I feel that like, if we're talking about America and then we're talking about prisons, prisons are a world in and of themselves. They're, they're um, run very differently. They, 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 there is no democracy. It's not about it, it, prisons are not the land of the free and the home of the brave, even when they're lo you know, located in the land of the free and the home of the brave. They're counterintuitive to all of those notions that are, that are in theory, supposed to make America great. Exactly. A lot of people don't realize that in prison, you can't access the Internet. Yeah. That's just simply not available. You don't have access to a computer generally, although you may have a computer education program, it is siloed. Yeah. It is so only the intranet in the prison, only what is available in the prison itself, uh, it can you access. You can't go online and do a search. Um, in addition to that, uh, most prisons uh, are required to have a law library although not all private prisons have law libraries, but they are not required to have a uh, reading library or a yeah. research library. Those things are simply uh, not available. Um, there are often restrictions on the number of books you can have. Uh, when, I was, when I was in, you could have a Bible and nine books unless you were in a college course and then you could have more books but some prisons uh, particularly in the south don't have uh, access to literature uh, they may have a bible i heard a, that a mississippi sheriff once said why the hell would i have books these people can't read yeah so there's no promotion of literacy um, it, it's, it's actually so disheartening to see the, the jurisdictions that don't promote literacy and, uh, and, and make, uh, material available. I, and I don't know what we can do about it. No. And it's, it's very, I mean, what we're talking about is, uh, um, if we start understanding the history of prisons in the United States. Um, and, and, and that, that industry, let's not fool ourselves that it's not, it's anything but an industry. Um, and then you, you look at how that developed, um, in the, in the 1800s and early 1900s after the abolition of slavery, um, 
and and this notion that by limiting anybody's access to information by limiting anybody's access to education you are limiting their ability to improve themselves and keep them stuck in their lot this is how um this is how slavery operated from the 1600s all the way up through the 1800s and and it's how prisons operate now a lot of prisons and it's not all prisons. I mean, I, I, I'm sure that there are some out there that are that where there are programs that are working um, to to improve people. But in general, that's not how we see even in our society. There's this notion of, well, if you're in prison, you deserve to be there. You, you did something wrong. You messed up. You belong there. And um, but what some of us know is that that not everybody in prison is guilty of the crime they, you know, were convicted of. Not every person in prison is a bad person. Um, people make mistakes. People get wrongfully convicted. People become the circumstances of an environment in which they have little control over their own, um, their own destiny, I guess we could say. And, and by limiting the ability for somebody to, to read and to research and to improve themselves, I mean, to me, that's just, it's absolutely ludicrous. You know, you're talking about, um, you know, prisons where the, you know, Bible, the Bible is one of the only books that they have access to. And, but that speaks to the sort of moral and ideological um, gatekeeping that goes on in, in, in these systems. And, and, and it's like, again, I, I, I've known people who um, have done time and, and some of them come out better and some of them don't come out better. A lot of it is what do you choose to do or what not choose? Choose isn't the right word, I guess, maybe. What is it that you do with the time that you're in there? But if you have no other options, if there's nothing out there and then you get out um, and then and then those opportunities are limited. How many places are willing to hire somebody who, when you fill out the job application, have you ever been convicted of a felony? You know, there's, there's so many uh, barriers that are, that are set up for people once they get out of prison, um, those barriers shouldn't exist while you're in prison. It, 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 the whole point of prison should be to help people improve their lives. Um, and I know, I, you know, I feel, I feel like I'm up on a soapbox and, mm-hmm. and um, being, uh, you know, maybe some sort of idealistic dreamer, but, um, you know, and, and, and that's not to say that the criminal justice system doesn't have its place, but there needs to be something more. And it shouldn't be, um, again, this moral ideological uh, um, barriers, you know, someone else that, you know, a, a sheriff or a warden or a county thinking, just lock them up, keep them up, keep them uneducated. That's the way we want them. If someone doesn't know how to read, we have a moral responsibility as a society to help them learn how to read. If someone is locked up for a crime, we have a moral responsibility to help them improve their lives. I mean, that's how I feel. Um, and speaking of gatekeeping, um, there are some prisons uh, in the United States. Uh, I'm thinking here of Colorado. And they use a public library model for their prisons. In other mm-hmm. words, they try to make their prison libraries as much like public libraries as they can, which means that as much as possible, they give access to a wide variety of material for uh, both research and reading, uh, pleasure reading. Um, There are other uh, states where the uh, prison librarians say the purpose of prison is for education and not to provide pleasurable reading that the the prison library should support the education system within the prison and and nothing more uh is this the kind of gatekeeping you're talking about where people where where librarians actually prison librarians choose what the prisoner can have access to you know um that's that's a great question I, i feel like you know, if there's a uh, there's books out there how to make a bomb and things like that, you know, uh, the anarchist cookbook, 
that, you know, maybe we don't need those in, in, in prison libraries. I don't know. I, I, who am I to say that? But I think that there's so much stuff out there that um, just because you don't like it, just because it's not your favorite flavor of ice cream doesn't mean it's not good for somebody else. Right now, when it comes to books um, and when it comes to information, I, I feel that um, I, I'm not the I'm not that person who who um, I don't want to be the one that makes that decision. You know, um, I think that if, if someone's in prison, they should have access to the autobiography of Malcolm X. Um, I also feel and, and I know I'll get into trouble for saying this. If they if you know, should they have um access to something like Mein Kampf? I don't know, but like if if I have to ban Mein Kampf and, and that means I also have to ban the autobiography of Malcolm X, then I don't want to ban either of them. You know, I mean, these are the tough decisions we have to make when we're talking about censorship. These are the tough decisions we have to make when we're talking about gatekeeping of, of and the access to information. Um, you know, for myself as a writer, I, um, you know, I have a, a graphic novel that came out earlier this year uh, it's nonfiction. It's about the life of Frederick Douglass. And, and I feel like that book should be in, in every prison and in every school library and every public library in the country. It was, you know, part of my reason for writing that book was to contribute something more than stories of superheroes, you know, beating up supervillains and, and that sort of thing. I, I wanted to um, contribute to uh, the, the educational process to, to the intellectual growth. And, and for me, it was a challenge to write it. But I also felt like um, just as I, I grew personally in the research and the writing of this book, I, I was hoping that someone else would get, get that. Um, but, you know, is, is there danger in teaching about Frederick Douglass? Because what, what you're really teaching is about the improvement of self. Um, you know, Frederick Douglass went from being an illiterate slave to being one of the most well-spoken Americans of the of the 19th century, um, and he changed America. and 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 people should have access to information about it. and And as someone who writes books that have lots of drawings in them, I also understand the appeal of of that particular medium. When I was a kid, I loved to read comics more than I loved to read books. And, and I know for some people who struggle with reading that that can provide a great gateway. And, and so to me, it's, um, it's particularly troubling because I know that there's a lot of library systems and, and teachers in this country that don't think graphic novels are a legitimate form of literature. I disagree with that wholeheartedly. And so we have this second battle that we're fighting within my particular corner of the world, which is trying to, you know, let people know that not only is there validity to this particular medium and this particular style of storytelling, but that it's also engaging to people, especially, you know, you're talking about um, if someone does have literacy problems, if they do have trouble reading, then, then I've discovered in my years of teaching and advocacy that, um, that the visual narratives provide uh, a, a, an exceptionally accessible entry point that the pictures engage people and 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 those pictures help to tell a story and and then we grow from there so um, you know I'm I'm one of those people who <laughs> I think I think everything should be available you know um, and I and I get it I get that prisons aren't the quote unquote real world, you know, but I think that there has to be access. We have to let, um, we have to provide the opportunity for people to better themselves in every level and every facet of our society. And so even though we could argue our prisons part of American society, yes, they are, they're here, they're in this country. We can't, and that's the problem. We, I, we, we tend, you know, we argue about rural versus urban. Right. You know, the, the, <laughs> if, if we can't decide what's what's good for rural America versus urban America, well, incarcerated America is a whole other. It's like a separate reality. You know, it's like a parallel dimension, but it's not. It's right here. It's in, and in a lot of our communities. It's right down the street. You know, it's, it's a couple miles down the road and it, it impacts everybody. And I, I think that's the other 
I think the problem is um, most people, if you aren't personally incarcerated or you don't know someone who's incarcerated or you don't work within the prison industrial complex, most people don't think about prison and how it impacts our day-to-day lives. Um, and, and I think that that in and of itself is a huge problem. Like we need to think more about, um, we need to think more about these things and not about, you shouldn't be thinking about whether prisons need reform. You, you, you need to think about it before somebody you care about is locked up or before you're, you yourself are locked up. And, and that's the problem. Most of us don't think about these things until um, it's way too late. Right. Uh, about 2.2 million people are incarcerated or in jail in America mm -hmm. these days, which is, of course, the largest single um, prison population in the world. But 5 to 10 million people are in the judicial system yeah. in some way. In other words, they're either in prison, about to go to prison, or just got out of prison, or have been are on parole or some form of supervised release. That's uh, that's a huge number of people. But in addition to that, more and more people are being put into private prisons and private prisons are by definition private. They don't have to meet the standards that federal and state and local prisons do. Uh, a few years ago, about 12% of the people were in uh, private, private prisons and now 20 percent or so of prisoners are in private prisons how do you how do you feel about uh the growing privatization uh in in the prison industrial complex well honestly it it makes me it disgusts me in a, in a way that um few other things really truly bother me i um I've been I've been working on a, a series actually for last couple of years trying to get it up and off the ground all about a private prison it's a, a hmm. series about the largest private prison in America and it's about the, the growing privatization of America and I think that um, you know again there were problems in the prison system before private prisons came on board but the moment you make it about profit the moment you make it about um, we have to keep these systems going in order to keep, you know, to meet our profits and to, to, to you know, um, our shareholders get their money. We got a serious problem here, right? We're talking about making money off of um, not just the warehousing of human beings, but making money off of crime. You know, it, at some point you have to question everything that's happening that that leads to private prisons it leads to people being incarcerated in private prisons and 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 who's making money off of it and 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 so to me yeah i'm 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 very opposed to to private prisons i'm very opposed to that um to any sort of system that does not allow us as human beings to reach our full potential of humanity, right? The moment you start bringing money into it, the moment you start warehousing human beings and seeing each one of them as a dollar sign, we get into some very serious problems. And, and then the moment that system is set up so that, you know, now, now if we had privatized rehabilitation and which someone could figure out a profit model in which helping people get their lives together was profitable, but, you know, maybe that's <laughs> I think they're doing that in colleges and universities and that's not working out either. So um, I think we have to we have to learn how to separate the need for for wealth from the need to um, improve our, our, our status as human beings. But, yeah, no, I, I, I um, it's, you know, private prisons is, is one of those things I've spent a fair amount of time doing research on it as, as I've been working on this project, which. I, I can only work on in little bits and pieces because it's so, not only is it so overwhelming, it's so demoralizing. And it's demoralizing to me, again, as somebody who is a, a citizen who is fortunate enough to um, never been arrested, never been convicted, um, and, and hopefully never will be. 
but I, I have enough friends and family who have been that, um, you know, the more I study, the more it just, it like depresses you, <laughs> you know, it just leaves you feeling uh, almost hopeless. Indeed. Uh, Pen America this week uh, published a, uh, an article which said that prisons were the primary source of banned books in America. Um, I'm sure that doesn't surprise you. Uh, no, no. The, the issue that they have or that they, uh, that they, I think, clarified for many people is that a book clearly may be banned, as you said, the anarchist cookbook or how to make a bomb can clearly be banned in prison, but that, that some states ban books and say, these are our banned books. You can't bring these books into prison. In Texas, that list is about 10,000 books. Uh, in other states, they say, we'll let you know whether we'll let that book into prison or not. And they may let it in one day and not let it in the next. Um, this lack of uniformity uh, across America is, is, I think, a critical problem. Uh, I, too, believe that graphic novels should be uh, in prison because there are so many people in prison who cannot read. Yeah. And the way to make them literate is to take them on a gradual step from, from the sim simple way of teaching reading that you might do with a kindergartner or a first grader and take them up. And the easiest way to bridge the gap between books and that early learning is graphic novels, in my opinion. I but agree 100%. The, the problem is getting people to focus on the fact that there is no uniformity in what may be allowed in prison and what may be excluded. Yeah, and I don't know that, I mean, that's such a huge issue to tackle. Um, I mean, the fact that we're having a conversation about banned, book, banned books week, right? That there's actually a list of banned books um, is pretty troubling in, in really in the, in the broad scheme of things. Like, how are there banned books in America? I mean, re when you really, really think about it, and, and this is a, such a troubling, look, I, I'm, I'm a liberal thinking person, right? Um, so liberal, in fact, that at times I have to face my own biases and, and realize that as someone who is opposed to censorship, it means you have to be opposed to censorship. You know, it's, um, it, it, they're, they're, you know, what, what are the rules? And, and, you know, the rules are, um, obviously if it's you know child pornography or something like that yeah that, that that we're taking that off the table but if it's something that i don't agree with because I, I i don't believe in its political views i mean i'll i'll give you a prime example i think that one of the most offensive books and movies of all time is gone with the wind i think gone with the wind is one of the most troubling <laughs> problematic pieces of of quote unquote art in the history of the united states now if I were to put anything at the top of my banned books and movies list, it would be gone with the wind. I hate it with every fiber of my body, but I would never ban it. I would never ban Birth of a Nation, uh, D.W. Griffith's film Birth of a Nation, nor Thomas Dixon's book, The Klansman, on which it was based. I would never ban those as much as I hate these things. Why? Because the moment you open the door to ban this thing, then that door is open to ban the thing that I love, the thing that, that the, the, whatever book it is that has informed me, whatever film it is that has informed me. And I know because we're talking about prisons, we, we sort of have to leave film off the table because uh, it's not like they've got DVD libraries in prisons. But, you know, the, we have to look at prisons as, as a community within the larger community of America, right? Every prison is its own little town or its own little county and we have to take responsibility for those communities just as we take responsibility for the communities that we live in right that we live in as free citizens and and so it's troubling to me that um you know if 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 it's going to be banned in a prison 
the precedent that allows it to be banned in the prison is going to be the precedent that's going to allow it to be banned in what, what do we want to call it, free society or vice versa, right? And this is where the problems start coming in is we, we have to, we have to be very careful. We have to learn how to, um, and I, I have trouble with it all the time, you know, setting my own personal biases, my own cert personal ideology aside and going, okay, again, as much as I can't stand, and I, I love going back to Gone with the Wind because it shocks people so much. Um, but it's like, yeah, you know, the, 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 the totalitarian in me would burn every copy of Gone with the Wind possible, and it would go with the wind. Um, but at the same time, we have to learn from it. And, and as, a, as a writer, and, and I teach part-time, I can use that particular text um, to show everything that's wrong, to show, well, not everything that's wrong, but a lot of the things that are wrong with our society, right? Um, and so it's, it's not a question of, of banning something that we don't like or that we disagree with. How do we grant access to it and then use it to teach, right? There should be teaching opportunities in everything all books, all films, and, and rather than hiding from it as if that's going that, that this, this particular text is going to damage us as a people or as a society, uh, what can we learn from that particular text? And the problem is we're not trying to learn, we're just trying to hide from the things that we're afraid of. I had um, this experience where I we were discussing on the uh, Prison L listserv, which is a, a listserv for correctional librarians. And one of the correctional librarians said that, uh, I will say he, he would never buy uh, a James Patterson book for his prison library because he didn't like uh, the, the violence and sexism in the book. And he didn't think, he, he didn't think his inmates should read James Patterson. So he simply didn't buy any James Patterson. Uh, do you think that that kind of attitude is the start of the slippery slope to banning great yeah, literature? It, it, it is. I mean, you know, my feelings about James Patterson's books notwithstanding, um, I, I there's there's a whole lot of books that I don't like, a whole lot of writers that I don't like um, for various reasons, whether it's their view on gender or sex or violence. Um, but again, it, it's the moment we allow that personal, those personal feelings to get in the way, our personal, our personal tastes to get in the way, um, you know, uh, it becomes pretty dangerous. It becomes pretty dangerous. And, and, you know, yeah, James Patterson's books are, you know, if, if I, if I had, if I were, went to, into a library and there was, you know, a ton of James Patterson books on the shelf, I don't necessarily know if I would check one out, but if the only options were James Patterson or the Bible, I think I would go towards, you know, um, a James Patterson book, um, the Bible's got far more violence in it than, than anything that Patterson's ever written or, or just slapped his name on, you know, but, mm -hmm. um, but I do think that that's dangerous. And it's, it's, um, I see it all the time, even, even within the comic book world, it's interesting to me because, you know, you'll hear people say things like, um, Oh, well, I love Marvel comics, but I hate DC comics. So I, I'm, I'm not going to carry any DC comics. It's like, well, who cares what you like or don't like? You know, this I'm talking about retailers and even some I've talked to some librarians who have some weird, you know, they like Spider-Man, but they hate Batman or vice versa. So they don't want it on their shelves. And it's like, it's not for you. If it's just because you don't like it. I mean, I don't like, you know, green peppers on my pizza. I like pepperoni. I like processed meat products on my pizza. Um, if I own a pizza shop, though, I, I'm going to offer both to, to my customers. Um, if I'm a librarian, I want everything there. It doesn't matter if I like it or not. Um, it's, it's, it's about providing a service to your, um, uh, you know, whether you, I guess you call them your, if you're in prison, it's to your, to your inmates. If it's a public library, 
um, or, or even a school library. It's to the people that you're serving. It's the community that you're serving. And, and again, like maybe instead of, you know, we're talking about prisons and prison libraries, instead of saying prisons and prisoners, maybe we should just be talking about, you know, the community that the prison library is serving. They, they, they are in fact, a community. They are human beings or human beings who are incarcerated by calling them prisoners. That in and of itself can be problematic because what it's doing is it's, it's turning them into a thing other than a human being. It's, you know, a human being who is incarcerated. That's what we're talking about. Prisoner is, is such an abstract thing. It really is. And, and, and our media and our society has conditioned us so that you know we hear prisoner and we usually think of either somebody in the old black and white striped uniforms working on a chain gang or something like that and that's not what it's about it's about men and women um and 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 anybody who identifies somewhere in between on that gender spectrum who are um who have been locked away for whatever reason and and i think that our goal should be to get each and every one of them out and into a position where they can um, function and be productive if that's what they choose. And there's some people that will never, you know, I mean, I'm, I, I, it's, it's interesting. I, I have an old, a friend who was like, you know, all prisons should be closed and some people and everyone should be set free. And, and I, as liberal as I am, I think to myself, okay, well, um, I'd like, before we set everybody free, Let's let's make sure that they're ready. Let's make sure that 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 uh, that the jobs are there, that the resources are there. Um, but at the same time, I think that we, um, yeah, I keep thinking about that James Patterson stuff, and it's like um, I read a bunch of his books when I was, you know, in my twenties, late twenties. I don't think I'd, I'd read them now, but I wouldn't stop anyone from reading them, you know. And and I think that that's. To me, that's just ludicrous that just because your personal taste um, doesn't doesn't click with that, there's somebody else who's going to. And, and, and maybe there's something in one of those books that will that will provide that spark. You know, um, I, I, I when I was in high school, I read Richard Matheson's I Am Legend, which is a you know famous novella about vampires and um and, and, you know, one of the most uh, influential horror sci-fi novellas of all time, that and, and Fahrenheit 451. I read both of those my freshman year in high school. And within those two books sparked something in my imagination that um, really pushed me to become a professional writer, that really sparked within my imagination something that I feel helped improve my life. Now, is there something in any one of those hundreds, if not thousands of James Patterson books out there that might spark an incarcerated human being's imagination to improve their lives? I don't know, but why not offer that and find out and see what's there? And that's the, that's the troubling thing. The moment we ban something, what we're really doing is we're, we're, um, we're putting limits on how individuals interact with these texts and what those texts do to um, to spark imagination. Now we have no, and so what we're really talking about is we're talking about trying to control how people think and how they imagine. And that's where we start getting really dangerous. And uh, the last topic I wanted to hit before we uh, open it up for questions is um, sex. Yeah. And Obviously, most people know that Playboy and Penthouse are usually banned or are banned from prisons, um, particularly federal prisons aren't allowed to have uh, any magazines that have uh, explicit nudity. Um, the prisoner's right to read in part says that sexually explicit material should not in and of itself be a reason to exclude uh, uh, material from prison. Um, do you feel, as I feel, that sexually sexually oriented material should be available to prison because it provides pleasure? 
It isn't redemptive. It isn't restorative, but it provides pleasure. And do you think that inmates deserve pleasure? Well, the, the, the short answer is yes. I believe that inmates deserve pleasure. Um, I believe that inmates are human beings. Um, that are there people in prison who've done some horrible things? Yes, there are. Um, but I happen to believe that, that, that as, as human beings, what we should be trying to do is help our fellow human beings reconnect with it. Um, now, of course, this is a lot of this is all we're, we're talking theoretically on a webinar over the Internet. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and and yeah, there's there. I mean, there's people in prison that are sexual predators and and some of them deserve to be in prison. And should they be allowed sexual pleasure? You know, I want to say it's not my my call to make, but if we're using that percentage of the incarcerated population as the the reason to deny other people their humanity then we're getting into some again that very slippery slope um i think that, that again i would love to see the day where where prisons aren't i don't think we're, prisons are ever going to be not needed in this country that's just the way this country is built right but i think that we could we could drastically cut back and we can change our relationship with both the system and the people that are incarcerated. And if, if this notion is that, um, you know, because here's the thing, if we say we have to ban all content that has any sort of sexuality in it because prisoners don't deserve any sort of sexual stimulation within their imagination, right? Let's, let's be blunt about it then what's stopping us from saying, oh, we need to ban anything that has comedy in it because prisoners shouldn't be allowed to laugh. You see, <laughs> this is where we go. We, we start with one thing. Um, this, this, if, if I can't read something that might you know, get me a little aroused, right? If we ban that because that's bad pleasure and we don't want, we don't want prisoners feeling good about that, then next thing you know, we say, well, they're not allowed to read anything that's funny. And then, and then they're not allowed to read anything that informs them about history, um, because it's 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 it might be bad history, you know. It might be the sort of history, um, you know. Who knows what bad history is? But I, I mean, you live in Texas, so you know what uh, some of the bans on on textbooks that have happened in in Texas over the decades. Um, it's always interesting. Um, what a, what one community thinks is good versus another community thinks is 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 bad or unacceptable um and again we talk about these things and it's one thing to say yes i think that that prisoners should have um have some access to things that make them happy it's, it's one thing to sit here and say that it's another thing to fight for that it's another thing to to also realize that you have to live with some of the the, the consequences of that but but not every, again, I've known enough people in prison to know that not every person in prison is a bad person. Some of them have done bad things, but I mean, um, and this is always, it's, it's not difficult to say. I mean, I, I've, I've, I grew, I've grown up with people who are, who have done very bad things, but they are still human beings and they still have capacity for good. And, and um, it's not necessarily my call to say that this person is beyond redemption. Um, this person, you know, I have a good friend who went to prison for, um, for felony murder. He, and he did a long time for felony murder. And he's out and he's turned his life around and he has a wife and kids and, and he's doing well. Um, and there, but there was a time where yeah, he did the crime, but then he did the time and he turned his life around. And, and I think that this is what we need to be thinking about. We need to be thinking about the human beings' capacity to change and improve themselves and not, again, not making money off of warehousing them. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? I haven't seen any posted in the chat box or in the comments, but if you'd like to ask a question, feel free to do that now.
did you have anything else, David, that you we wanted to cover that uh, you felt uh, was important that we missed so far? No, I mean, I think that I, I'm sure that whoever is listening or watching right now, um, most of the librarians I've, well, all the librarians I've met are like some of the greatest people I've ever met, you know, um, and and I am such a strong proponent of libraries and uh, um but I think that it's 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 crucial that the moment you place yourself into a position of gatekeeper in some capacity, you you really need to understand the responsibility of what that means. Um, there's and and for better or worse, what comes with it. And and I and I think that um, just this conversation for me has been it, it's it's again. I don't talk about prisons too much with people because it's not one of those things that people like to talk about. You know, they, they're more interested in um, the new Spider-Man movie or something like that. Um, but I, I think that it's important to, to understand the humanity of people, you know, and um, even people who've done very, very bad things are human beings. Um, and, and, and even if that pushes your own personal, um, you know, it, it pushes against your personal beliefs, you know, um, it, it's, it's, you have to free your own mind. And, and, and I think that as we talk about banned books, we have to let some of our own biases go to understand that, um, you know, I'm working on, I just I just wrapped up a project a not a nonfiction project won't be out till 2021 about the Black Panther Party and uh, it's it's amazing the lack of information that's out there about the Black Panther Party and when you stop and think about all the information that isn't out there that also means that it's information that's not out there about political repression it's information that's not out there about um, police brutality. It's also information that's not out there about um, illiteracy and 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 medical apartheid. There's all these all this stuff is tied to the history of the Black Panther Party. Um, and it was I, I remember making one of my many trips to the library and getting into a conversation with one of the librarians who didn't know that much about the Black Panther Party. And to me, again, librarians are. Um, they're like rock stars in my world, you know? And so when I meet one who, like, if I ask them a question, if they don't have the answer, I, I almost feel disappointed. I'm like, oh, like Superman can't fly. Um, <laughs> and, and, uh, but it's always great having those conversations because I was all, also have never met a librarian who wasn't open to learning about new things. That's just my personal experience. Um, David, uh, they have a question. Have you ever struggled with confronting your own biases in your writing, or have you added biases to any of your characters purposefully or not? Um, the answer to both of those questions is yes. Um, my own biases are, um, there, there are quite a few. I mean, I'm, I'm a middle-aged man who was raised in America and in a patriarchal society, and that comes through unfortunately a lot in my writing um although I, I try to catch it more often than not but um there was a time especially in my 20s when i was writing where every protagonist i had was a guy and there was there was no strong women there was no um and and i was very stuck in these traditional gender binaries in my writing and i'm trying to break out of that and and i'm always open to when people respectfully point these things out to me um and and so, yeah, I, I struggle with my own biases almost every single day. Um, and and then in in um, in my own work, I, I struggle with it too. I want to present it. There's um, I was fortunate enough to write um, two graphic novels starring the character Shaft, John Shaft, the private detective, and a novel. Um, the character Shaft was based. Uh, Ernest Tidyman wrote seven Shaft novels in the '70s. And I love those books and I wanted to do something with the character. So I worked out a deal and, and was able to do that. And then one of the graphic novels, if you read the original Shaft books, he's a, a very homophobic character and homophobia runs rampant in, in the books. 
And, and I wanted to tackle that in one of the graphic novels that I wrote. And um, I, but I realized in order to do that, I had to write a homophobic character saying and doing homophobic things. And there was so much fear and trepidation on my part because it was like, I didn't want people thinking I was homophobic because I had Shaft saying and doing these things that are, that are, um, you know, very negative. And, and I talked to some of my friends, um, several of my, my friends who identify as being queer and, and ran it by them, ran by some of the things I wanted to do. And, and they were, because they were my close friends, they, they understood what I was trying to do. And they said that they would stand by me. And if anybody, you know, came on the attack and said, Oh, David Walker's homophobic because he's got this character saying this thing. Um, and, and fortunately that never happened, but I did hear from fans that were like, you know, Oh, thank you for, for tackling this. Um, and I, and I think that as writers, like you shouldn't, as a, as a writer, I shouldn't be afraid of having a character be sexist. I shouldn't be afraid of having a character be racist. I shouldn't be afraid of a character doing morally reprehensible things. That doesn't mean that that's how I am. But the question is, what do you do with that? What do you what do you have the character do? Do they learn a lesson? Is there a moral within the story? Is it does it is there room for growth? Is there room to to shed light on things? And so I, I'm constantly looking for the things that I'm afraid of. Um, or the things that I, I, I'm not sure about. And, and going back to this this book, I, I this graphic novel I, I was working on on the Black Panther Party, man, there's some stuff in there that was really, really difficult for me to, to grapple with. Um, you know, um, Eldridge Cleaver was not a good person. And, and, you know, there's parts of the time where I was like, I, I just wish I could leave Eldridge Cleaver out of this book because I disagree with so much of what he said and did. And then I realize, oh, but then I'm going to be responsible for that sort of censorship that I don't that, that I don't think is correct or proper. Anyone else have any questions? Feel free, uh, David. I wanted to thank you personally for this conversation. It was it was wonderful. I, I was a little concerned about. Uh, what we would talk about for an hour, but I think we could probably we could probably go for another hour and touch on a whole lot more. But I really appreciate your your growing interest in prisons and helping the people who are in prison to escape, yeah. either in reality or in their imaginations. And I I think that that's. You know, I don't know. I, I, I mean, maybe it's because when I was a kid, I knew people in prison. You know, I had family members in prison. And and my first time visiting the, uh, uh, um, a penitentiary, I was like maybe six years old at the oldest. So, I, I, I mean, I've been to them. Um, and maybe that's that's part of what has put this, I guess, level of empathy in me. You know, this this feeling of I, you know, I hope I never end up there. But part of the reason I, ne I hope I never end up there is because I know people who've been there. And, and, um, and I think if we're talking about libraries and libraries and prisons, I mean, let's be honest. Books give us hope, right? There's some people that are going to be in prison the rest of their lives. You know, people that are doing long stretches. They're never going to get out. And is it so bad that they get a little bit of hope or that they get a little bit of respite. Um, it's, it's, uh, I just feel very strongly about that. And I, and I think that it shouldn't, you shouldn't have to have a, that close of a relationship with the system that whether it's you or somebody that you care about, be locked up to really start to think about it. Um, but it's, you know, it, it's, it's, most people don't necessarily even think about cancer until somebody really close to them gets cancer, you know, They'll, they'll write a check to, um, you know, whatever, some American Cancer Society and keep their fingers crossed that it never happens to them. You don't see people doing that sort of stuff with prison. It's like it's not until the, it's right there in your face. Um, and, and the moment you begin to understand that the system isn't set up for rehabilitation, um, you know, that it's, it's set up for maximum profits. 
And the only way you can keep maximum profits is to keep as many people locked up as possible. You know, worst case scenario is you have a bunch of shareholders and a bunch of guards and, and wardens, and then all of America is locked up. <laughs> you know, there's like 10% that's making a profit off of 90% that's locked up. And, and as ridiculous as it sounds, it's like, yeah, there's somebody who's going, wow, you know, I mean, there's somebody crunching numbers right now going, how can we get another 10,000 people locked up? You know, that's scary to me. Okay. I think it's one o'clock. Okay. That should, uh, and uh, unless there are any more questions, any more questions from anyone, we'll be, we'll be <laughs> thanking you for attending this uh, Band Books Week webinar. And we thank our sponsors once again, uh, uh, Image Comics and the IFRT and uh, uh, the uh, comic books and uh, uh, roundtable. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, David. <laughs>